vast majority of, of tax avoidance, tax dodging that goes on in this country, almost $8 billion a year, give or take, goes into things like tax havens, CEO stock option loopholes. Those are things that Trudeau promised to go after and hasn't. The government's saying it's 150000 before anybody's affected. We're saying 50000 If we can't agree on this, it is reason enough to go back to the table and consult until we can. The figure is about 36,000 people might be affected by this change. No, 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 no. We have 54,000 doctors in Canada. We directly employ 108,000 people. That alone, and we only represent 12% of the small business that are impacted, so 36,000 is just wrong. From the Zoomerplex in historic Liberty Village, The Zoomer with Libby Snymer. Hello and welcome to The Zoomer. The Liberals say it's a matter of making wealthy Canadians pay their fair share. The opposition says these changes will hurt many who are far from rich. The issue has dominated Parliament since it resumed sitting. We have been listening to Canadians all summer, indeed for many years, Canadians who find that it's unfair that our tax system, which was heartily endorsed by the previous government, gives advantages and benefits to the wealthiest that aren't there for the middle class, including hard-working middle class small businesses uh, and farmers. We are going to ensure that wealthy Canadians do not have the option of using private corporations to get out of paying uh, lower tax rates uh, than uh, to paying lower tax rates than middle class Canadians. That's something the Canadians expect in terms of fairness, and we will continue to support the middle class, including small businesses that create. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, he still doesn't get it, and his arrogance is astounding. He's attacking the entrepreneur who has to self-fund her maternity leave because she doesn't have a government-funded plan. So she puts a little money at the end of every month away so she can afford to take time off when the baby comes. Now, right now, she pays 50% tax on any passive income she earns on those savings. And the Prime Minister's plan will tax her now twice, once when it goes into the business Shame. and once when it flows to her. So why is the Prime Minister forcing female entrepreneurs to choose between their business and their families? Right, Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, it's very clear that the members office that don't actually understand this proposal, but there's no big surprise because they didn't understand for 10 years that giving tax breaks to the wealthiest doesn't help the middle class, doesn't grow the economy. That's what we saw uh, from them in government for 10 years. Uh, Mr. Speaker, and even now that they're in opposition, they continue to not understand. They stood and opposed lowering taxes for the middle class and raising them on the wealthiest 1%. They opposed ending the sending child benefit checks to millionaires so we could do more for 9 out of 10 Canadian families. That's what we're focused on. Well, while the politicians battle it out in Ottawa, we've assembled a panel of people who will be affected in the real world. We have a doctor, a farmer and a bake shop owner as well as labour and tax experts on both sides of the issues. We're going to drill down to find out who will be affected and whether it's fair. But first, let's tee up the topic. They say only two things in life are certain, death and taxes. In July, Canada's finance minister, Bill Morneau, announced a proposal to close three loopholes to stop the rich from avoiding paying their fair share in taxes. The government says it will put a stop to income sprinkling. This is where income is shared between a family member in a high tax bracket with one in a low tax bracket, and it affects as many as 50,000 Canadian families. It also wants to crack down on passive investments in the private corporations, which benefit from lower corporate tax rates, and wants to stop business owners from converting income into capital gains, which reduce income taxes by taking advantage of lower tax rates. But it'll be an upward battle for the Libs. In a recent survey of over 8,000 business owners and tax practitioners, 95% said that the proposed changes would hurt small businesses and their families. So what then is fair? Well, first let's hear from our panelists on how they will be affected. 
Doctors have been one of the key groups singled out by these changes because most of them are incorporated. And the cynics also say they're a good target because most people won't care about raising taxes for wealthy doctors. So let's start with Dr. Sean Watley. You're a practicing physician and president of the Ontario Medical Association. How will this affect you? I have a rural practice, it's a part-time practice. Our total billing, total billing is 150. So that is meant to pay for our staff, our lease, our equipment, everything. That's 150. So to pay for all of that overhead takes another 50 to 60,000. So once you take the 60,000, 50, 60 out of the 150 total, you're left with about 90 to 100,000 and that's where you save for retirement, you buy your disability and your and your medical benefits, etc. Um, what most of us are doing who are, are married and if our, especially if our spouse is not working is we split that perfectly. So 50k in dividends to one spouse, 50k in dividends to the other spouse. Even if that's being changed, so the corporation is being essentially uh, eliminated, the benefits of the corporate tax structure, that will impact docs on the lower end of the spectrum. So this is what I said when I met with Minister Morneau in Ottawa. I said, what are we going to do about those practices on the margins? Because that's what's going to impact patients. On the margins, I don't have any extra money to pay for renovations, to buy technology, to hire staff if he raises taxes. Let's hear from the other side, David McDonald. So I just released a study uh, that looked at uh, the impact of, of income sprinkling in particular to see who would most likely benefit from it, uh, how much it would cost and so on. Uh, about half of the benefits from small income sprinkling, uh, small business income sprinkling, uh, go to the top 5% of families making over $216,000 a year. So it's a very focused benefit at the very high end of the income spectrum. If we look further down at more traditional uh, small businesses, things like family restaurants and family farms, they're about 2.5 times less likely to be using uh, income, uh, income sprinkling. And so in the broad scheme of things, about 5% of families, of, of the 900,000 families that receive small business dividends uh, are likely actively using income sprinklings. Mark Wales, you're a farmer. How will this affect you? One of the biggest challenges we have in farming is passing the farm on from generation to generation. So there are over 220,000 farm families across Canada. Usually about three quarters of those will pass the farm to the next generation. Sometimes there may be three generations living involved in the farm operation. The new rules would require the previous generation to exit completely from the farm in order to be able to use their capital gains properly and be able to have no further involvement in the farm going forward. So they wouldn't be able to pass on the things they've learned through decades of farming. So that's probably our biggest concern, although as well, some of the rules that they're talking about, the reasonableness test around income sprinkling, uh, it's not uncommon for kids to come back and help at those key periods of harvest and, uh, and, and planting, where it's all hands on deck, often around the clock. And those kids in the 18 to 24 year old group who CRA have already indicated they're not going to believe much of what they do. And the only way that they should be entitled to something if they're em is employed all the time. Julie, you represent small business. How will most of your members be affected? What we are being told by our own tax professionals who are members of CFIB across Canada is that this will affect businesses with incomes as little as $50,000 a year. That's not a wealthy individual. And I think it's important also, Libby, to point out that these are not loopholes. This is tax policy that's been in place for decades to incentivize people to start a business. Starting a business involves risk. It involves the risk of the entire family, sometimes immediately, immediate family, sometimes extended family as well. If people aren't incentivized for taking risk, I ask very simply, who will create the jobs in this province and in this country? Most jobs across this country are created by small and medium-sized businesses. I'm very interested in the overall context in which this is unfolding. It is urgent for Canada to improve its overall revenue structure, which has suffered dramatically over the last 25 years. Uh, let's get to Nathan Cullen in British Columbia. Uh, so what is your take? So we've said two things. One is the vast majority of, of tax avoidance, tax dodging that goes on in this country, almost $8 billion a year, give or take, 
goes into things like tax havens, CEO stock option loopholes. Those are things that Trudeau promised to go after and hasn't. So a lot of small business owners are saying, well, okay, first of all, this doesn't, these changes don't apply to Mr. Trudeau or the finance minister's own personal fortunes. Second, if there's these big bunches of taxes that are being avoided by the ultra wealthy, why not go after some of those as well? So we've said extend the conversation to allow people in and expand the review that they're doing so that we're not just talking about just one small subset of the economy. I think these measures, clearly the government um, made some missteps in its rollout. Uh, it didn't, certainly didn't provide clear objective as what it was trying to do and everybody think everybody, they're going to come after every single person that, that's a small business owner. That's not true. And I think it's fundamental that we have a really respectful conversation because if we do, I think many Canadians on average, I pay my fair share of taxes. And I think many Canadians will say, listen, it's only fair if I have to pay, which is the average Canadian, anywhere between thirty to $40,000 pay their taxes all the time. I think those who make higher income in this country should be expected to pay their share. share. Okay. We have different tax rates. We have personal tax, corporate tax. And the reason why we have different tax rates is because we want to incentivize business owners. We want a reward risk. For example, if just to take the current system, we tax business income at a much lower rate than passive investment because we understand that passive investment, there's no risk. Okay. We'll be back after a quick break. We want to make the tax system fair. With that, I agree with Mr. Trudeau. Yet, there is, there's an element of concern that some of the benefits that apply to him and apply to his finance minister are not being addressed. Welcome back to the Zoomer. There's also a lot of uncertainty around the government's proposed tax changes for small business. For instance, a new reasonableness test will be applied to what a corporation pays out to family members. But there are no rules. It looks like the Canada Revenue Agency will make a judgment. And if a business owner disagrees, they'll have to fight it out in tax court. Dean Atwell from our sister station, Joy TV in Surrey, British Columbia, checked in with a local bakery owner in Port Moody. Let's take a look. for about a year here and okay. we uh, um, employ about 15 individuals here. It's so hard to survive um, as a small business and it feels like it has been getting harder, not easier. And those are the ones we've got by the slice and then we've also The Liberals' proposed tax reform for small businesses will include changes that affect income splitting and lifetime capital gains exemptions. Here in Port Moody, British Columbia, a local bakery operator feels that operations like hers are being unfairly targeted. I mean, with the income splitting, I mean, my, my husband and I both work in the business, so that one doesn't affect us right now. The concern that I have with it is down the road, you know, this is named after our daughters. We want them to be involved in the business. Um, but there's like the subjectivity piece that I still don't quite understand. But um, what Juliana's capacity will be as far as her involvement, um, that remains to be seen. But she should be able to be, like, gainfully employed, hopefully, here. Um, and that's the goal. So this puts that into question. How's it going today, guys? You guys working on your Southwest mix? We're yeah, well. good. What has the reaction been, not only from your employees, but your customers here? You know, the way that it's been explained, it's just a matter of being fair. But I don't think it's a well-rounded conversation because there's a lot of um, realities that face small business owners that people don't know. And so we just want the ability to have like a more involved consultation process so that we can really get to the bottom of the impact this is going to have. It doesn't feel like that's been done yet. Somewhere like this, it would be really sad if it closed because we're, we're quite limited anyway. We quite struggle, don't we, to find somewhere local. The tax reform has resulted in a strong reaction from both employees and employers here on the West Coast. I'm Dean Atwell for Joy TV News. So exactly how will a business like that be affected? David, you just worked out some numbers on this. Right. It's very unlikely that a business like this would be impacted by what they're proposing. I and mean, there's two ways to return money to uh, the owners of a business. One is through salaries, just like everybody else gets paid, wages and fees. And the other is through dividends. 
Now, the reasonableness test already applies to salaries and fees and has for some time, so it's not a surprise uh, to accountants and lawyers that put these structures together that if you're paying someone a salary, they should be working for you and doing some work. That reasonableness test is rarely litigated in legal court, um, and so you know if you're if you're paying your uh, your kids maybe a bit more than they may deserve, that's fine. Revenue Canada is not coming after you for that. So the idea is to extend this reasonableness test not just to salaries and fees, but also to dividends where it presently does not apply. And I agree with you, may not affect that family in particular now. But let's assume that this bakery does relatively well and mom decides to, you know what, I'm going to retire and I will, she's been active in the business and I'll pass on my bakery to my child. We do what we typically call a, an estate freeze for tax purposes, which means that we uh, take the shares that mom owns currently and we freeze them at the value of at the time we, we decide to pass on the business. And then the child could come in, be a, a shareholder of this business and will enjoy the future growth of the business. So now mom is well into her retirement and decides that, you know what, I'd like to get some dividends from my business, which I've worked for many, many years, although now I'm retired. So these rules will apply because she's not working in that business anymore. So when she takes back those, uh, redeems back those preferred shares, she's going to be taxed at the highest marginal tax rate, which the, uh, under the legislation is 45%. Yeah, and so it, it definitely discourages people from income splitting, which is exactly what the debate we had in 2015, right? We canceled federal income splitting, saying that it's largely high-income families that are the ones most likely to benefit from this, and therefore uh, people should be taxed at, uh, you know, at, at not as a family, but as individuals. Our members are telling us differently, Libby. They're telling us on income splitting. We did a survey of over 8,000 members, and two-thirds of them said they will be impacted by this measure. That's not e what the stats of I'm Statistics Canada show. I'm just telling you, David, show, so, yeah. what our members are telling us. That's uh -huh. who I'm representing here today. Yeah, yeah. We take our cues from our members. Yeah. It was a survey of 8,000 members, and we also did a survey of 400 tax professionals that happen to be CFIB members, and they're not telling us what you're saying. So my point in all this is, if we can't agree, if the government can't agree, the government's saying it's 150,000 before anybody's affected. We're saying 50,000. If we can't agree on this, it is reason enough to go back to the table and consult until we can. Anytime you propose to change some rules that's going to affect a particular group, and it depends on how organized, you're going to make a lot of noise. And there's a lot of noise being made about these changes because the people who have benefited from them don't want to see the change. But I think overall, when the dust settles, many economists and others have looked at this, the final numbers that people could at least agree on, there may be about 36,000 people that might be affected by this at the end of the day. There's still consultation going on in the government because they realize that they have obviously have not heard enough. The messaging has not been very helpful to the government, that the process that rolled this all out was part of the problem. And so if there's a, a general sense that we want to make the tax system fair, with that I agree with Mr. Trudeau. Yet there is, there's an element of concern that some of the benefits that apply to him and apply to his yeah. finance minister are not being addressed. And Canadians will accept uh, someone pursuing a hard conversation about fairness, but they want it to be fair. Hypocrisy doesn't wash well with voters. So if we can extend the conversation and if we can expand it to include the full tax measures as the CFIB, the Chamber of Commerce, the CLC, Hassan and others have said, why not take the reasonable proposal that's been put forward rather than trying to continue on a path that I'm not sure is entirely working for the Liberals and certainly scaring a lot of the small businesses that I talk to, whether they're right or wrong. F fear is a palpable thing when you're running a small business and you have to address it to make sure that people don't feel that they can't invest and grow that small business like we want them to. One of the things that I found fascinating, though, uh, was apparently, and this is from Twitter, was that the Prime Minister's Principal Secretary, Gerald Butts, apparently told Steve Bannon, Donald Trump's former chief strategist, that there's nothing better for a populist than a rich guy raising taxes on rich guys. There might be some political calculation. Uh, Gerald Butts, you know, is, is Trudeau's main advisor. Yet, if it doesn't apply to Mr. Trudeau's own circumstance or to his own finance minister's own circumstance, there's a lot of small businesses, doctors, lawyers, whoever, who are saying, wait a second, if you're coming after us, 
what about all those privileges that Mr. Trudeau and Mr. Morneau enjoy? Come on, let, we can expand this conversation to make sure that the entire tax system is fair, not just so narrowly focused on this one element. Okay, we'll be right back with more of the Zoomer. The redistribution of wealth overall is crowding women out of the high and medium income zones after tax and pushing them further into the low income areas of the population. Answering media questions yesterday, the Prime Minister described his, quote, family fortune, which is held in at least three separate numbered companies. Oh, Must be nice. Yeah. Shockingly, he confirmed that he will not be affected by the tax changes he claims are intended to make wealthy Canadians pay more. So while the Prime Minister is going after local plumbers, mechanics, and farmers, he's bragging that he won't be affected. So how is that fair? The Finance Minister wants to double tax the investment income of small businesses for a total of 73 percent. But public corporations, those trading on the stock market, are exempt from this new double tax, so they will keep paying the current lower 55 percent on their passive investment income. How is it fair for the pizza shop owner to pay a higher tax rate than will pay the millionaire owners of public companies like, say, Morneau Chappelle? Oh, yeah. So you just heard some objections about the fairness of these tax changes. Well, they focus on the owners of private corporations. They do not touch the beneficiaries of family trusts, which are a vehicle for the very wealthy, including both Justin Trudeau and Finance Minister Bill Morneau. They also don't affect the taxation on large public corporations. In addition, an actuary from Bill Morneau's own former firm, Morneau Chappelle, came out and said that if the government wants to promote fairness, it should make changes to public sector pension plans. So what about these arguments? Nathan, you've been talking about this. There's a few things within the tax system right now that encourage the very, very wealthy to try to move money overseas. Uh, various estimates come out from the government from the Canadian Chamber, from different taxation groups, but it's a lot. <laughs> let's, let's say that it, it, what's sometimes called aggressive tax planning can move upwards of $8 billion per year away from the Canada Revenue Agency, away from taxes. So through all of this, the question that's been put from the opposition to the government is, this doesn't affect personally the Prime Minister or his Finance Minister. How do you justify that? And to, to my mind, the best example was the KPMG scandal, in which we found out that there was a, a known and set up tax scheme going on. The government has cut a sweetheart deal with KPMG to get out of that whole situation. And so to a lot of Canadians, a lot of small businesses, they say, well, again, it feels kind of hypocritical. Well, I agree with that point. But I'd like to focus the attention at the other end of the spectrum, because in all of the concerns being raised about the transfer of family businesses and agricultural operations, et cetera, to successive generations. What is being ignored is the fact that the combined effect of the ongoing tax cuts that have suppressed the rate of tax paid by Canadian-controlled private corporations and the ease with which dividend tax credits can be used to shelter the tax liability on withdrawals of dividends to various family members who are not actively involved in the business operation itself. What is happening is that the percentage of women who are actually active in the small and medium enterprise sector is falling. Since 2007, what started out as 20% of all small and medium-sized enterprises being majority owned by women as their own enterprises, that percentage has now shrunk to 15%. And at the same time, the number of women who are involved in equal ownership corporations, which are the ones that are most likely to be involved in income splitting, has grown by 5%. And at the same time, women own such a small percentage of capital of all forms, including business activities, incorporated or unincorporated. What's happening is that the redistribution of wealth overall is crowding women out of the high and medium income 
zones after tax and pushing them further into the low income areas of the population. So, so there is a gender di dimension to this that is not really uh, visible unless you start looking at the impact on women specifically. Gender plays a huge role in this when you talk about the physician groups that are being targeted. So uh, well over 50% of the new younger grads are females and most of the new practicing physicians are women. And as I said before, they're using their corporate structures to be able to get on with life and start families and get going. The corporate structures have allowed them because of the preferential tax treatment that it receives to be able to um, save some money in there and actually pay for their own maternity leave. Uh, as you know, Ontario does provide a small amount of maternity leave, uh, 17 weeks, um, but the maternity leave that doctors get doesn't even cover their overhead. In fact, it doesn't even cover a couple days a week of their overhead. Certainly changes of this sort will make it very, very difficult. We could also talk about issues when you have a separation, when you have a mom doctor who's trying to care for their spouse and their kids and spend alimony payments and all the rest. That is only possible if they have these corporate structures. If they raise taxes on doctors, they just aren't able to do that sort of thing. The other point with the doctors is that uh, you were given the right to incorporate in lieu of a fee hike. In 2004, the Liberal government arranged that and uh, they showed us how to uh, arrange our affairs. They wrote information leaflets on it and so the legislators wrote the rules and told us what to do. And so it feels a little odd to change the rules so far into the game. Well, now that was the provincial government that yeah. did it. The yes. federal government's paying right. for it, so they but just they pushed the bill around. They should talk <laughs> to both, each both other. Liberal, both Liberal parties. Okay, we'll be right back with more of the Zoomer. Most Canadians have no choice in terms of lowering the tax bill because they're paid on salary. They don't have access to these loopholes, so they have to pay what the government says they have to pay. our look at the proposed small business tax overhaul. According to a Main Street Post Media poll, 54% believe high income earners are currently paying too little in taxes. 55% believe the middle class is paying too much. So a lot hinges on the question of exactly who is wealthy. This policy, whether the gar government I mean, intended it or not, is harmful to small business and will result in lost job opportunities and lost jobs. Bottom line. I don't know about anyone else there, about there this. Okay, let, let, him, let, him, let, him, let him respond. Okay. There is a segment of small business will be affected by these changes. I don't want to sit here and pretend. But the vast Thank majority you. of small business will not be affected by these I changes. And I think that. That, that's, that's not what our members are well, saying, listen, I've, I've seen many of we the... We did a survey uh, of 8,000 of them. I've seen many of the numbers economists have crunched right across the country, and they're consistent in what the numbers are coming up. The figures about 36,000 people might be affected by this change. No, 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 no. We have 54,000 doctors in Canada. We directly employ 108,000 people. That alone, and we only represent 12% of the small business that are impacted. So 36,000 is just wrong. We have 54,000 incorporated the doctors estimate, in the Canada. The estimate for finance and on income sprinkling is 50,000. The study that I just released yesterday is 48,000. Three measures. That's right. That's on the income sprinkling side specifically. That's okay, but right. so so their right, numbers I, might make sense when you look at all of them. Uh, but again, it's a fi it's five percent of small businesses, that small small business families that are going to be impacted by income sprinkling. That's that's pretty small. That's not right, true. Too. Right, but, but it is, but, well, it is okay. Statistics Canada's okay. tax modeling even software. You, but even if this... you're right, the, my understanding of it is that the passive income thing is is the real cash cow in this. Well, passive well, yeah. income is helping people yeah. survive. Passive income unbeknownst to a lot of people who might think it's being used for other things, for a small business, it's a survival tool. It's a tool to help them buy inventory. It's a tool to help them reinvest in the business. It's a tool to help them create jobs. Well, and that's, and that's what it does. The, the issue is, is when you're taking that money out as dividend payments. And, and that's, remember, that's what's too, trying to David, be that here, small right? businesses don't get financing as easily as their larger counterparts. What we're talking about here is everybody. Most Canadians have no choice in terms of lowering the tax bill because they're paid on salary. They don't have access to these loopholes, so they have to pay what the government says they have to pay. What about the risk? 
How should we reward risk in the tax system, Nathan? I'm hearing from both ends of the business sector, those that are trying to get in and those that are just hoping to exit at some point, that the tax policies that were put in place, they understood was a way to mitigate, to lower the risk. But this is, as we see in your conversation, Libby, this is incredibly complicated. And one of the things I've found frustrating as a parliamentarian is that when I try to debate this with my colleagues, my liberal colleagues in the House, or explain it to my constituents, without actually having all of the changes in hand with the analysis, exactly who's going to be impacted, and some scenarios so that I can go out to the local restaurant, to my local doctor, and say, let's run you through a scenario and tell you what these changes mean, and so you can make up your own mind. The last budget, small business tax was cut at the federal level. Are brought down again to again to try and again uh, Actually, recognize Actually, Hassan, it. I'll have to interrupt oh. because they broke their promise. They're supposed to lower it federally no, but to 9%, that, and they didn't. But hang on a minute. The last budget did reduce small business tax, corporate tax, from what it was from the previous budget. That's a fact. I asked Morneau, why don't they take more time? I said, last time we made this big of a change, Carter Commission, 1962, the tax changes came through in 1972. Why are you doing this in 75 days over the dead of summer? And he said, well, if we give people more time, they'll just rearrange their affairs so it won't impact them. I thought, oh my goodness, so is this about fairness or is this about getting more well, tax dollars? And some so of the changes. For who? The, the tax system is actually a bad mechanism to compensate risk or to encourage entrepreneurs to gain risk. The only thing that the small business preferential tax rate does is incentivize businesses who are making money to reinvest that money in the business. If you want to if you want to help entrepreneurs, you need to do it in other ways in addition to a small business tax rate. You want to do it in ways like providing them with uh, like through the, the, the providing the financing through um, a small business uh, through a small business bank. You want to do it through encouraging exports, through Export Development Canada. Uh, and those are the types of things that will help young entrepreneurs. The tax system doesn't help them immediately um, because they, they're not making anything, right? As, as I think everybody's agreed, there's been a lot of bad messaging here. We've heard the Prime Minister at one time talk about, well, this will affect people making $250,000. i have heard the Finance Minister use $150,000. Mm -hmm. we have had so many different numbers about who this will affect. That's the challenge. We've had like a 72-day consultation period, and as you mentioned, the last time they made major changes, they did it over six years. However, they want to have this done so that January 1st, new taxation year, CRA can go out and start collecting money. This is about forcing people to take money out of corporations mm -hmm. through dividends rather than keep it for business planning. I mean, in the case of farming, uh, we never know when the next disaster is coming. So if you were a cattle producer in 2003, for example, just prior to BSE, on May the 19th, life looked really good, and on May the 20th, suddenly the borders were closed and stayed closed for the better part of 10 years for what you produce. Mm -hmm. So we, we have, you know, small business owners have a broad range of uncertainties to deal with. We have all kinds of risk. Farming in a special, not only do we have all the other risks about marketing what we do and everything, Mother Nature gets the final word on what we do every single day. And the challenge is when you leave it to the CRA auditors to determine whether this is reasonable or whether that's a passive investment or not, uh, that could eventually affect everybody. I mean, farming, 220,000 farm families across the country, a third are incorporated, and probably another third are in partnerships. And some of those partnerships will be affected as well by the intergenerational rules around capital gains exemption. And normally, if you're a farm and you want to pass it on, you would, you would incorporate, use a trust, and then pass it on to your kids, whether they're farming. So, so even if you're not incorporated, you could, be, you could be implicated. So there's a whole lot of questions here. Who's the target? How do you want to be fair? And how do you want to not be unfair to those who weren't the original target? Okay. After the break, we'll hear from our audience when we return. I have been searching for information on this. Very little information out there. I've been going to YouTube to try to get some answers. Who do I go to? Who do I talk to? back to the Zoomer. Let's hear from the audience now. And we have Paul Lochner, and you're a small business person. Thanks for coming to the roundtable. What's your question? Thank you. My question is, is I have been searching for information on this. Very little information out there. I've been going to YouTube to try to get some answers. And that's why I came to this forum today, to, to see what help I could get, or um, who could I talk to, or whatever. 
So my question is, is who do I go to? Who do I talk to? There is a, there is a paper, a 62-page paper that's out. Uh, you can read that if you like. Uh, there's a section on income splitting, but you'll have to read between the lines. I mean, the best place to go is probably your accountant, mm -hmm. who hopefully is following this, uh, who would be able to tell you what the implications might be, whether you're, you know, the question is, I guess, whether you're income sprinkling, so mm -hmm. whether you're sharing with a spouse or an adult member who's, who's, who's making little or no money, and it's not contributing to the business. That's right. the first question. And the second question is whether you're retaining earnings in the company as a means of uh, retirement savings or mm -hmm. savings for a rainy day in terms of personal income. If you're retaining income in the corporation just to, to reinvest it next year, buy something next year, you'd be unaffected by this. Um, or if you're paying your family members, spouse to work, you'd be unaffected by this. But, I mean, there's, there's more details on the capital gains side as well. If you're mm -hmm. planning to sell your company to your kids through a line of corporations called a pipeline uh, to, uh, to, to, in essence, transmit dividends as capital gains and pay a lower tax rate, you might be affected. But, I mean, your accountant's probably the best place. Paul, thanks so much. Okay. Hi, Alan. Alan Chan is an accountant, and um, I guess you're getting a lot of questions from your clients. Essentially, a lot of my friends, colleagues, clients, uh, they use corporations to uh, generate passive income because they don't have uh, a lot of other savings or pensions available to them beyond the, the government-sponsored uh, ones, old age and CPP. So uh, they're using this uh, corporation mechanism uh, in order to save their money for their retirements. Uh, so in terms of the government and what they're doing or what they're proposing, uh, they're, they're going to basically come back and say that we're going to tax passive income at a greater level uh, and restrict the amount that you can actually get in terms of savings from that. Uh, is there any, do you know if there's going to be any sort of grandfathering or if, is there any sort of discussion in terms of uh, how they're going to reduce or, or change that? Yeah, I believe that's the idea, is that there would be a grandfathering for passive income that already exists. Okay, so the question I have, you have existing passive investments. They're taxed when you take them out. Mm -hmm. But you can take them out tomorrow, you can take them out in five years, you can take mm -hmm. them out in 20 years, and people I've talked to said that that's just crazy complicated. It is. It is crazy complicated because I don't know how you trace that. Yeah, it becomes an issue. I mean, obviously what you want, I mean, there is a retirement system that exists for everyone else, right, who doesn't have a small business. It's called RSPs and TFSAs. 13% of private sector workers have a pension plan. 87% uh, of private sector workers don't have a pension plan. This is not unique to, to professionals and doctors and lawyers. There just aren't a lot of pension plans that exist. Uh, and so I think one of the, one of the bigger issues is, uh, you know, you can certainly legally use a corporation at this point to bypass the retirement system, the RIF rules, the RSP rules. The question is, should the government be paying for it uh, when everybody else has to live in those rules? I disagree. I actually disagree on that point because a business owner doesn't mean that a business owner can take the same salary every year. The, in the beginning, they could be taking no salary, therefore they cannot contribute to an RSP. I mean, and they of, might make it big on one day. Earners, a lot of minimum wage earners aren't, aren't, aren't employed uh, full-time, uh, you know, full-time, full, full year. Uh, you know, this, this type of insecurity is not unique to professionals who make $200,000. It spreads all the way down to people who make minimum wage. They make twenty thousand. We're talking about business owners, and we're not talking about just professionals. I'm just saying that. I'm, a, I'm talking about Canadians, right? There's a lot of Canadians that don't that don't have small businesses. They work for minimum wage or just above. Okay, stay right there. We'll be right back with some final thoughts. Regarding our Pharmacare episode taping and the discussion on universal drug coverage, Marianne tweets met with Andrea Horvath on the Zoomer. She heard the message. Kathleen Wynne and Patrick Brown, are you listening? On Facebook, Ellen comments on our discussion about proposed tax changes and diminishing corporate pensions. Quote, Trudeau is downsizing your savings. You would be wise to hang on to everything you'll need for the future. With his taxes on pensions and everything you buy, living will be difficult. Get ready to grow your own food and defend your families. Keep the comments coming in and don't forget to log on to thezoomertv.com for full episodes and more. Welcome back. 
back to the Zoomer. Before we conclude, I want to go around the table for some final thoughts. Let's start with Hassan. Well, listen, I'm honored to be here today with colleagues around this table. I think as Canadians, these debates are very important for all of us to partake in them. And when ultimately, I hope it informs the government to get the policy decision right. I've learned a lot. I'm, I'm really appreciative. Uh, expand the conversation to include all tax fairness issues and extend it. So there's no there's no panic. <laughs> there's no crisis imminent. Let's get this right. There are some merits in what's being discussed. But I'm, I'm mostly grateful just to have learned even more about this complicated issue. I think this is a good step, as I've as I've uh, said before. But I think it should be the first step, not the last step, in terms of looking at tax expenditures more broadly that apply not just to small businesses, but also things like CEO or the capital gains inclusion rate. There's been a start of a very private process that's happened in finance, but it'd be great if that was actually a public process where we examine the $100 billion we spend in tax expenditures every year federally. I've learned a lot myself. I appreciate that opportunity. And I would just like to say in conclusion that I hope that someone in government is watching this debate. We're so far apart on these numbers. It's a reason to go back, take the time, and do it right. If it's about targeting the bad people, then let's use a more precision scalpel approach. Thank you. We've had some great discussion. It's pretty clear that this is really complicated. The government needs to take the time to get this right, make sure that if we want tax fairness, let's make sure we, we, we go after the people who are truly avoiding taxes and make sure that along the way we don't do permanent damage to small business owners of all type. As a tax lawyer, I can say that these are really complicated rules. Even for myself, it took a long time for me to understand them. Um, I do want to clarify that, you know, I don't see them as tax loopholes because these are uh, it's, it's, uh, the way our tax system has worked for many, many years. And a lot of these uh, structures that we put in place have been tested in courts all the way to the Supreme Court. I, I hope that at the end of the day we can get this to slow down and so that the government will actually talk about real people. How does it impact the small business owners, real actual examples and patients? And so my passion is about patient care. So let's look at the impact on patient care before we make these drastic changes. Please slow down, let's get this right. Okay, that's the message. Thank you for being with us. We'll see everyone again soon. It's time to zoom out.